recording in progress uh, or progress to be more accurate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. prog rock though. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. But then it wasn't progressive rock. For some reason, we said progressive rock. Yes, that's true. Yeah. What did the Americans say? Did they say progressive rock? <laughs> they just called it rock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pomp rock, they called it, didn't they? They probably oh, did. I, rem I remember when it was called contemporary, contemporary rock. But I think they stopped it because I couldn't say it. That was the reason <laughs> they changed it. Uh, clearly. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Right. Well, um, I've got both of your images here. Um, I only just realised I had yours, Peter. So I've set up the screen so that Beth will be uh, displayed just for the purposes of the, the way that it records on the video for the tiny little clip I might use in a trailer. But I, I, I emphasise this is an audio podcast, uh, so you don't have to worry about nose picking and all the rest. <laughs> um, so I've got both of your images. Uh, Beth's going to come out. In I'll nice turn my light off then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you're, I was, doing, you're doing a visual thing as an audio podcast that's weird kev even for you well, it's just because zoom enables us to look at each other and we can I, i've realized editing it up without looking at the pictures uh i'm getting one message and one level of conversation even i was though i was there and then i looked again at the pictures this morning to make a trailer which used the video clips and i thought oh yeah the people actually were implying something different just by the way they said it the way they looked the way the hands were moving which you totally yeah, yeah. didn't think yeah. about uh, oh, yeah. maybe they were doing that a lot <laughs> <laughs> Good, well, it's, it's the realization that I've had because I've been doing uh, Twitch streams every day yeah. for the last just over the last six months. And the realization from people who've watched those who followed me on Twitter or other things for ages have just gone right now that I have the context of what your face looks like and how you talk. Yeah. You come across incredibly differently. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm lovely. If you've ever read and I'm sure we all have interviews with Alan Moore um, yes. in print, R.C., inevitably yeah. arsy and then when you're there i went to one at the edinburgh book festival uh, a few years ago he's being interviewed by steve um steve thingamy from the guardian what's his name steve bell steve bell that's it steve bell. all right yeah and everything alan said is almost literally tongue-in-cheek and i realized as i was hearing it when I read this on paper, everyone's going to just pile in because it sounds irony. It's how irony yeah. works. You say one <laughs> yeah. thing, you mean another thing. Well, um, it's, yeah. it's very, it's very dry. It's like you know, I always get a bit annoyed when people say Americans have no sense of humor. It's just like, no, it's dry. Yeah, yeah. you know, they're actually joking with you, and you yes. can't tell. Yeah, definitely. But there you go. Hey, we ought to start doing a show. Yeah, okay. probably. Yeah, let's do that. Let's give it a go. Then let me begin. <laughs> Hello, listeners. Today's recording may involve some strong language and some adult themes. It might not, but uh, I've met these people. I think it's going to. Hello and welcome to Comic Cuts, the panel show. My name's Kev F. Sutherland. You might know me as a writer, an artist for Beano, Marvel Comics, Oink, Viz, Red Dwarf, Doctor Who, and my graphic novel adaptations of Shakespeare. But chances are you probably don't. My guests... My, my guess, yes, good. Let's laugh at Kev doing himself <laughs> down. My guests today talking comics are Peter Hogan and Bethany Black. Hello. Hiya. Hello. Hi, hi, hi. hi. <laughs> I, hey, always, hey. I always wait to hear what anybody will do at that point. <laughs> but wait for this. I'm going to do the theme tune. Ooh. Yeah, don't get your hopes up. Tension. Oh, yes, especially if I click that, that <laughs> bit incorrectly. Uh, right, I'm going to sing over this and it'll go like this. Comic Cuts. We're looking at a panel and we comprise a panel. There's a few of us. So the panel sees a panel and we talk about the comics from the panel we discuss and we call it Comic Cuts. Go on, be honest. I really like that. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah, genuinely. Well, that's a lot kinder than an acquired taste, which is what most people make of it. <laughs> I have two guests with me today who have brought with them a panel from a comic or something close. We're going to see if we can identify it and talk about it. Maybe we and you will learn something about comics we didn't already know. Or maybe we'll just show off and have a bit of an enjoyable chat. Let us see. Hello, everybody. Hello, Kev. Hi, Kev. Thank you so much for <laughs> being with me. 
Joining me from, might I guess, London is Peter Hogan. Is that where you are, Peter? No, used to be, but uh, about 12 years ago, I moved down to Tunbridge Wells, which is kind of like South Ooh. London. It's just very south. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's got the cliche, hasn't it? Uh, annoyed of Tunbridge Wells. Have you met many of them? No, because it's it's bollocks, basically. I mean, virtually everybody we know here moved down here from London. Um, so, like I say, it's South London. Yeah. <laughs> and you're the you're the oddity in Kent, aren't you? Because every statistic they put out for the rest of Kent is uh, something like I don't know, rabid racist. I might be generalising. And then Tunbridge Wells <laughs> is the oddity uh, for COVID. Uh, levels it was it was that wasn't it yeah but that's all north kent um which is admittedly a bit grim you know then tunbridge wells <laughs> is, is like the the right at the bottom of the the triangle it's about to drop down into the next county so you know so things are different here i mean you know tunbridge wells is one of the few places in the country that voted remain yeah so, that's so one of the that things that gives you some idea yeah. Mm. I think that's one of the things that first uh, alerted uh, we Guardian readers to it uh, was, yeah. was that very thing. <laughs> now, I'm looking at the CV for you, Peter, and it's incredible. I didn't know that Pete Townsend asked you to set up a bookshop once upon a time. How did yeah, that happen? It's true. it's true. Well, I knew Pete and um, he had a small book, uh, publishing company and he wanted to open a bookshop. And I was the only bookseller he knew in, in all probability. So um, that's... That's how it happened. And, and then, then from, you know, after once I'd done that, I moved over to Pete's Publishing Company to produce books on rock music for the world. Uh, eel Pie Publishing. Yeah, what's the derivation of Eel Pie? Often wondered. Uh, it's from Eel Pie Island, which is a, a place in the Thames at Twickenham, right, right opposite where Pete was living at the time. And um, it had a hotel on it, which was uh, where lots of bands like the Rolling Stones and, you know, Manfred Mann and wherever. It was it was big in the early 60s. Yeah, <laughs> Everybody yeah. played there. You have to be talking about the early 60s when you name drop Manfred Mann. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good point. Well, actually, well you're, yeah. you're actually sporting the chin beard. Yes, I am. I am. Yeah. If only this was a visual podcast. If then... only it were a <laughs> The world would know this. In fact, most of the your, world is uh, poorer for it, I think. They yeah. certainly are uh, denied. Because uh, a lot of your career, well, in fact, most chronologically, was the music business, wasn't it? Working as the press officer for Rough Trade for the Smiths. Yes, that's true. Yeah. I don't know where you got this CV from, but it's, so far you're doing good. <laughs> it, I think it's fairly obvious that this CV is just when you read Wikipedia and oh, there uh, you go. scroll down, you get IRS records, you were working... Uh, uh, plugging REM when they came over for the first time. Yeah, that was uh, around about the time of their third album. So um, uh, they did a small British tour that I was on. Um, and then they played this huge gig in Milton Keynes supporting U2, uh, which also had the Ramones on it. So I got, I got to hang out with the Ramones, which was great fun. Because they now really you're... are like living cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Now, your first comics work that I was aware of was your 2000 AD work. And what yeah. I didn't realise is that I think you have the unique distinction of being one of the only people to have work in 2000 AD under the name Alan Smithy. Yes. Is that right? Why yeah. was that? <laughs> Why was that? Um, it's because the editor changed and... Uh... Should I name names? Yeah, why not? David yeah. Bishop came in and basically fired me and acted like a general twat about the whole thing <laughs> um and um and you know told me that he was he was going to you know savagely edit my work and uh, you know cut it to shreds and all the rest of it in which case i said okay take my name off it because um, you'd already been working so, for 2000 AD for, for a few years by then it was not hard yeah, like a couple of a, years a, a couple a of a years debut script that he felt he had the right to, to do that too Oh, he was just throwing his weight around. I think it was first day on the job, but you know, um, it was just completely unnecessary. So I said, take my name off it. And he, he said, well, you know, what name shall we put on? And I said, well, okay, well, the Hollywood thing, if you disown something, then you're Alan Smithy. So we'll go with that. You've made your piece with 2000 in more recent years and, and have returned to their pages. Yes, yes. I did a, a thing with Brendan McCarthy a year or two ago. Which was great fun, which I did basically as a, a chance to work with Brendan. Fab. Because, oh, and, because Fury Road, that's why. You know, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And since 2011, 
Resident Alien, um, with which yes. I think the world is, of course, famous now because of the TV series. Uh, and we might get on to whether you feel rather dwarfed by the TV series over the comic, because you are, of course, the creator of uh, the, the source material, the, uh, you and Steve Parkhouse, the creators of Resident yeah. Alien. I mean, how do you feel True. about the TV series? How do I feel about the TV series? Um, it, long story short, I really like it. Um, because although it's very different from the comic, it's like they've kind of um, they've taken the same kind of uh, premise and just gone in a completely different direction with it. Um, so it's it's not very faithful, but it's kind of faithful in a bizarre way in terms of the spirit of the thing. Um, you know, Chris Sheridan has come up with something that's you know that's very kind of. Uh, very warm it's about being uh human it's it's a lot of the things that we do in the comic you know and it's he's got you know there's more of a humor angle there whereas um you know the comic is more serious um but uh, but it's really enjoyable and it's really well done so you know i'd far rather have that than have something that was faithful but bad um yes. you know it's it's a much better result and the weird thing is i mean I, I always knew that there would be people that you know like the comic but not the tv show or like the tv show and not the comic um but the the way it's turned out it seems to be that most people like both which again is a result and I would count myself in that camp, which bringing me to my second guest, there is an overlap. Uh, okay. There are two TV shows competing for genuinely, and I'm not saying this because of who's on today, uh, competing <laughs> for my favorite TV show of 2021. Uh, one of them is Resident Alien, genuinely, because it's such a successful TV show in being a, a family friendly, accessible show, which, you know, it's yeah. an awful lot easier for a lot of TV shows to have carte blanche and to be sweary words and, and uh, oversized budget. And Resident Alien is, is absolutely hitting home with what it's got. And, and I love it. Love it. The other show was uh, written by the person who, in their last <laughs> Channel 4 TV show, had uh, my next guest as an actor. My next guest was in author of It's a Sins, Russell T. Davis's last <laughs> Channel 4 series, Cucumber and Banana, and she is Bethany Black. Hello, Beth. Hiya. How are you doing? You all right? Uh, well, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm all the words, <laughs> That was a but... really, like, really convoluted way of going, she's not been on telly for a while. I'm saying uh... uneditable. <laughs> I, I cannot edit my introduction to you. I'm an idiot. I tell you, though, the coup that Beth has pulled off, and I don't know if anybody else has pulled this off, you have been in a Russell T Davis mm -hmm. and you've been in a Stephen Moffat because you've yeah. yours. you were in Doctor Who when yeah. Stephen Moffat was at the helm and it was written by Mark Gatiss. That's a triple yeah. whammy. Yeah, a triple, which meant I got to spend a full day in a recording studio in London with Mark Gatiss whilst we went over uh, all of the ADR for the episode uh, I, because all of those spaceships in Doctor Who are made of wood. <laughs> so so they creak an awful lot so you have to re-record everything that you say um so yeah so, hello yeah. what was that noise we, we, sorry that I've was got... a that was a, a motorcycle going past my house i've got a guy streaming grass outside <laughs> peter want to compete no 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 it's tumbleweed here yeah no i yeah i've just literally that yeah that's the only person who's driven past all day and it's happened to be a ridiculously loud uh, uh moped so yeah there we go um yeah no i it was lovely i managed to yeah i'm very very lucky in both of those things i mean the connection between the two of them is that andy Pryor is the casting director for both of them and like cucumber and banana was my first uh, TV acting role I'd never wanted well I'd wanted to act when I was growing up and then I met drama students and uh, <laughs> and so I became a stand-up comedian instead and um and so I'd kind of given up on that entirely and then I had like the worst 18 months of my life where just one thing after another went wrong and I was I'd actually literally on the day that I got in touch with them about the audition because they ended up doing an open casting for the role that I got um I had phoned the Citizens Advice Bureau that morning to find out how you declare bankruptcy uh because I was like that poor and otherwise I wouldn't have gone for it I was like well what have I got to lose uh, apparently it costs uh, over 500 pounds to fill out the forms for bankruptcy which uh I didn't have otherwise I <laughs> wouldn't have been claiming bankruptcy and then when, <laughs> when I spoke to them about that they said well can you not borrow it I'm like what do you think got me in this trouble in the first place oh. um 
and who am I supposed to borrow it off? Like saying to someone, oh yeah, can I borrow 500 pounds? What's it for? Well, a piece of paper that says I don't owe you anything is what it's for. Um, but I ended up, I like that a bunch of people had sent me a message saying you should audition for this. So I did. I went in and I got the role. It's like big role as well in a, in a, yeah. in a big prestigious sort of TV series. And on my first day, in fact, it was, it came up on Facebook memories earlier. Today is the anniversary of the day that we did the read through for the thing. And I wow. arrived there. Um, I got out of the cab that they'd ordered for me and Andy Pryor, the casting director, was stood outside. Uh, I think he just nipped out for a cigarette or something and, and, and said, oh, do you want to come in? Like, don't worry about a read through because um, like a lot of people do get nervous. And I was like, oh, I didn't realise you were supposed to be nervous. Like I'm a stand up. I've been on stage without any script at all, having to <laughs> make up having to make up what I'm going to say to try and make like 3000 people at a music festival laugh. Uh, so this seems quite easy, all things considered. And I just said to him, you know, oh yeah, no, I, I yeah, I kind of, I know what read throughs are like. I've seen enough Doctor Who confidential for that. And he went, oh, <laughs> oh, you a Doctor Who fan? I said, yeah. He went, oh, I cast that. And I had to act surprised and went, oh, oh, really? Do you? He said, yeah. Do you want to be in it? And I went, yeah, please. And he went, ah. Oh. I'll keep an eye out for, for a role that's suitable for you. And about a year later, he got in touch when I think I've got the one. Do you want to come and audition for it? So it's great. Did, didn't, didn't you stump uh, Mark Gatiss with a question about Doctor Who, about whether the show was set in the 38th century? Yeah. But, and, and like it was one of those things that ended up in Doctor Who magazine and various other places because Mark Gatiss had written this episode and it was set on a space station that's orbiting Pluto that's falling out of orbit and is about to get crushed under its own weight. And um, it's set at the same time as the Sunmakers, which is set on Pluto. Um, and as a result of that, the, 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 um, the set designer, the props guys, who are absolutely unbelievably good at what they do, um, I realised, because I've been watching the Sunmakers the week before we started shooting, and all of the guns are the same design. Um, and so I was like, oh, right, okay, so it was based on that, was it? And he was like... Um, I, uh, I I don't know. So did, no. and it, yeah, it was basically it was a coincidence. But he was like, "Oh, but did the oh, set designers right. ha have the jump on Mark Gatiss as yeah, far yeah, as their did, yeah. re who research was concerned?" Yeah, yeah. There's a guy. Yeah, one of the uh, props masters, a guy I think is guy called Liam, who had yeah, who like encyclopedic knowledge of Doctor Who, who had gone, "Ah, oh, this is set at this time. What else is set at this time? Ah, oh, this is right. Let's have a look at the let's have a look at the weaponry. Let's have a look at the other stuff." Um, and so, yeah, the guns are like the same design in both of those. It was, it was fantastic to, to see. But what was really interesting about it for me, just in terms of as a fan of these things, was looking at the set design in the Sunmakers and then looking at the set design of the set that I was on and realising the sets aren't any better. It's just the way that they light them and the way that lenses work now. You can get away with so much more and make it look so much better uh, rather than being in those big, brightly lit studios where just light bounces off everything and you go... Uh, and they did. I mean, I yeah. can't imagine how in 1977 they would have had uh, that final sand dissolving effect, spoiler alert, yeah, uh, yeah. that affects the, the lead character. I, you'd probably just thrown some sand in his face and had him wipe it off. Well, yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. And those are the things that people remember. But the way that the sets were built, like they're always like, oh, you know, because there's that whole thing of, oh, the sets were wobbly and they weren't. But And you look at the set, the way that the sets were built there and the way that the set that I was on was built. Um, and like going, yeah, that's the same thing. It was a wooden spaceship with uh, where parts of the design, the decal of it, which is supposed to do something, are just um, Ikea uh, kitchen um, plate drying racks turned upside down and screwed into them. And well, that said, you, you have just brought to mind a, a Tom Baker series uh, where aliens were literally made of bubble wrap because nobody had seen yeah. bubble wrap before. That's about the same time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there's loads of stuff like that. And it's so it's like it's really interesting watching how because like wandering around going, what's this? Oh, right. OK, that's just like, a, oh, that's like the heat sink off a graphics card. Right. OK. And this is. All right. And it's just like day to day objects that they found. They go, that'll look good. And somebody's managed to put them all together in a way that just goes and makes it look fantastic. And then they go and put a load of, uh, of, of uh, gone and fired a smoke machine into it to go and give it that nice misty look and then turn the lights down. And everything's like, oh, this looks really, really good now, as opposed to just like, let's light everything on it so you can see every single floor. Talking of things that look really, really good, we're here to look at some comic strip panels. Before we do that, 
I think I referred to Russell T Davis's It's a Sin as Years and Years because it stars the guy out of Years and Years in It's a Sin. So let me just say It's a Sin in a few different tones of voice so I can edit that back in and not make myself look like a tit. It's no, a you, sin. You did say It's a Sin, so you're absolutely fine on that one. Although uh, one of the characters in Years and Years was named after me. So that's the other one. Uh, oh, yeah. in Years and Years there was a character called Beth. Bethany. Not called Not called Bethany Black. No, not called Bethany Black, but called Bethany. Oh. Um, yeah, and after the first episode, I phoned Russell and went, did you base that character on me? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, yeah, OK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, that's cool. I think you'd give him that. <gasps> yeah. Right. We've got two guests and they've got panels. I've asked everyone on the panel to... I'm going to start again. I've asked everyone on the panel to bring a panel to the panel. You can see these images on my website, kevfcomicartist.com, and on my Twitter, and hopefully on the podcast page, depending where you get your podcasts from. But don't worry, you shouldn't need to see these images because we're going to describe them. Whose should we look at first? Peter, can we have a look at yours first? I, I am going to share this. Now, and I'm going to just tweak things. Can we all see the image on the screen? Yes. Yes. So, innocent listener at home, you shouldn't need to be able to see this picture because we are about to describe Peter's submission. Aren't we, Beth? Oh, Have yeah. a go. What are you looking at? <laughs> I'm trying to figure out where this is from. I like I, well, I do, vaguely... before, before you guess, let's let's conjure it up in words for anyone who can't hmm. see it. Um, yeah, it's what you can see is uh, the silhouette of, of somebody holding a cigarette with a smoke billowing around it, saying, Miss Grant, may I see you for a moment? And Miss Grant is saying, oh, yes, yes. And you can see the, ta the top of a 135 millimeter rifle scope within the silhouette of the person um, who's, who's doing the looking. Uh, now, um, automatically showing my ignorance, I thought that was a camera. I thought I was looking at the silhouette of a uh, person uh, presenting a chat show, because the guy with the fag on looks like it's a 1970s chat show. Way behind him, he's in silhouette, and then closer to us would be the camera, although, of course, that's way too small for a camera. You're quite right. It's obviously a rifle. He's in silhouette, and then beyond, there's the woman. What's the woman look like, Beth? She looks, she's, oh, she's got that sort of 19, uh, nine, late 1960s, early 70s sort of um, look about her with uh, a sort of bluish grey hair and the nice big round eyes that are wide apart. Um, yeah. Very heavy, very heavy black eye makeup. The style yeah. of hair drawing and the style of uh, the uh, makeup drawing is much more like the stuff I remember seeing in Jackie and Diana, which my sister got, and Princess Tina. Those DC yeah. Thompson girls comics, the ones for the older reader, the teenage reader, where you'd have fashion orientated design and characters um, the, and the line drawing. You'd see this in um, women's magazines. My mum's woman's own would mm. have, I think, this style of, of fashion drawing. A, yeah, I was going to say, she looks like this, uh, the drawings that you'd have on the front of dressmaking patterns that you could buy. Yes. I mean, they were really... very much that sort of face, like so many of those from my childhood. It's saying 1968 to 1972, just in the mm. eye makeup, the lipstick, the hair. I, I can't, I don't know what to make of the fact that the woman has no ears. Because this is a time when earrings were a big deal and ears were still a thing. Maybe it, maybe the, the artist is the Rob Liefeld of ears. Um... <laughs> also, um, the smoke and the hair mirror each other. The smoke is done in a yeah. lovely swirly style. It's beautiful. Well, yes, and with a, a uniformity of lines, suggesting it's been done with a dip pen rather than mm. with a brush. I'm doing this for the benefit of the panelologists out there, the people who like to study this kind of thing. Uh, the flowing of the costume is done with the same. So we've got a fine drip pen for those lines and then we filled in solid black. As for where it's from, Beth and I are going to have a guess. I'm drawing a blank to begin with. Beth, what would you think? Yeah, no, I'm absolutely drawing a blank. It sort of, it reminds me of some of the uh, sort of like early early to mid 70s Marvel stuff, but I think that's just the colour scheme, which is just of that era anyway. Um, so, God, I couldn't even hazard a guess at this. 
Well, if it wasn't for the fact that there's a page number set into the panel, we're at the bottom of page three. I yeah. would have thought we were looking at a British comic, but that page three thing is much more of an American yeah. thing. The flat colours don't look like it's been scanned from a 1970s comic, so it might be a reprint of a 1970s comic, reprinted uh, sometime from the uh, late 80s or 90s onwards, which is where you would get these flat colours from. So it's something that was worth collecting up into an edition. Um, I'm going to hazard a guess. Is it from Wonder Woman, from that period in the 1970s, where she was really down to earth and didn't have a superhero costume? Peter, do you want to tell us where, where's this from? It's from 1969. Right. Uh, it is American. And it was written by Stan Lee. Right. that give you any clues? Yeah, well, I, except that, that makes it Marvel. Uh, and I was it does with make DC. It Marvel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because well, that's what I was thinking, because it's it's the three colours and that. Th and also, well, Stan Lee's dialogue is unmistakable <laughs> pretty much everywhere. <laughs> Okay, it's from all of his characters talk like talk like Stan Lee. So yeah, it's um, yeah, go on. It's and from I, a romance comic called Our Love Story. Oh wow. wow! Wait a minute, is it Jim Steranko? It is Jim Steranko. I yes. had just last week read someone talking about this. They must have shown a, a panel and a cover from a Jim Steranko romance story. It wasn't this that they showed. It's quite uncharacteristic for Steranko, isn't it? Well, it is and it isn't. I mean, the sort of, you know, the, the swirliness is kind of Steranko. And he did, um, he did quite often do um, things where he'd use spot colour or spot black and white. Um, uh, so that, that sort of contrasty thing between the black and white foreground and the colour background, that you see in some of the sort of, you know, Nick Fury strips that he did. Mm hmm well, one of the big things about Steranko is the fact that he was not afraid to um, uh, to magpie techniques from other artists. Um, I was aware of that when I saw a lot of techniques that I thought were all invented by Steranko and subsequently realised that I'd, uh, when I discovered Will Eisner, that I yeah. was now seeing them for the first time. So they were done for the first time in 1948, forgotten about and rediscovered or reclaimed by Jim Steranko. And yeah, uh, yeah sometimes he'll look like Wally Wood. Uh, with the way he's doing his rendering and in this case he's looking like uh, a fashion uh, artist from uh, like we've been saying knitting patterns uh, another time he'll look like well he, he did the great some of the great when he did x-men some of those great superhero poses that get copied by everybody yeah yeah but eisner was the one that i spotted way back when because there was a uh, harvey comics did a spirit compilation in the mid 60s which was the first time i'd seen you know uh, will eisner do anything and then when Steranko came along like a year or two later I was like oh this guy's you know obviously influenced by the spirit um yeah. but hardly anybody had heard of the spirit in those days so well we have the uh, concern about uh, now uh, for anybody listening to this podcast I'm wondering who has heard of Steranko I mean Beth how familiar are you with Jim Steranko yeah I'm, I'm familiar of, of uh yeah I mean because I I Thankfully for uh, Marvel Unlimited, I'm now going back through all of the stuff from the 60s and 70s and and having a look through. And so I'm like, I'm f aware of Jim Stranko's work um, and often recognisably enough to go, oh, right, OK, that's that's of his book. Like, yeah, this, I mean, because I wouldn't have necessarily said that I was going through my head and going, which who is it who who's done this? Because I recognise it and I couldn't quite place it. But the second that you'd said it, I was like, yeah, of course. Um, for my generation, the Steranko work that we first saw was when we got Captain Britain, the weekly comic, and his Nick Fury Agent of Shields, which was his uh, defining work for Marvel from the 1960s, was reprinted, and it was reprinted in colour, which was a first for these British reprints, and it was reprinted bigger than the Americans had seen it, and it was in litho, so it looked better than the Americans had originally seen it half a dozen years earlier. And yeah. immediately after that, he then did uh, what was termed by many as the first graphic novel, a thing called uh, Chandler in Red Tide, uh, which was done uh, with a 
panel of picture with a panel of dialogue underneath it slightly sounds like Rupert Bear the way I describe it but it was a paperback length book in colour and he was really experimenting with new ways of doing these things drawing from photographs so he had another style again uh, but Stranko just he really carved into new territory that nobody had done at that time and this really shows how many different styles he could he could adopt Gina, is there anything yeah, more you I, tell us about this romance comic, Peter? Uh, I don't know anything. I mean, I, I, this comes from a collection of uh, Taranko stuff that includes his Captain America stories and a few other things. And this is kind of like tagged onto the end of it. So, so it came as a surprise to me. I'm, the one thing about Taranko and reprints, I find, is that the colour is usually atrocious. Um, and you... And, I and a number of people have said over the years, you know, what we'd really like to see is a nice big black and white, you know, coffee table collection of this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, Colouring of comics from the 60s, 70s, well, and older, is, is, is a problem, isn't it? Because if you're true to the way the original viewer saw it, you'd have to print the black lines in grey and you'd have to make all the colours go out of register. Yeah. And then if you take the colours and make them true, as this reprint has done, they're garish, they're far brighter than you would have let them go as because the colors came out muted when they printed them in the old process uh, so your other alternative is to recolor it and then you get things looking like they neither belong in the original era of the 60s and the 70s and don't belong in the present day because they're they're done in uh, decades apart well you also look at you, you see stuff where it's, it's like they've scanned the original comics and done it badly so the whole thing just looks like mud we were so lucky, those of us who got those British reprints, uh, which mostly through the 1970s, the Marvel Weekly reprints. I always tell the kids yeah. that, that I used to get 10 a week and have change from a quid. Uh, and all, <laughs> all, all that does is emphasize how very old I am. But they were, <laughs> they were printed in litho and they were printed in black and white. So you had A4 pages where you could see the mm. artwork as crisp and as true as the original artwork itself. And the Americans uh, didn't get originally to see that. Now, of course, you get collector's editions, which were actually scan from the original artwork will show you unrobbed out pencil and blue pencil and I think don't really they distract you from the story because if I'm seeing the shadow of a voice bubble I'm no longer in the comics world I'm in yeah. the paste up world yeah and and why did you choose this panel Pisa? just because the idea I thought it would stump you you know it's one of those things that it was so unusual I mean I, I went looking for um uh, Steranko was one of the first names that sprang to mind and I thought you know there, there are some extraordinary bits where um, like in, the, in one of the Captain America stories he goes into the Salvador Dali sequence like yes. a dream sequence and I thought yeah that's fantastic but of course it's got dialogue all over it and it's got you know Bucky in the costume and you think yeah this is going to be easy to guess and while I was looking for that I stumbled across this so Stranko did Dali a couple of times, didn't he? He did him in the Captain America story and he does them on a, a Nick Fury Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. cover. Yeah, yeah. Which again is just Stranko magpieing. But so many people forget that there are other things to draw on rather than previous comics. So I think it benefits everyone when someone like Stranko looked widely at pop art and looked widely at surrealism yeah. and then ripped it off and put it wholesale into his comics. Well, yeah, I think it's, at the, it's kind of at the heart of comics, really, is the fact that, um, uh, you know, Will Eisner went to the movies a lot, obviously, yeah. and was just stealing left, right and centre um, from Orson Welles and everybody. So yeah, it, it cuts both ways. Uh, a lot of people have taken from comics and vice versa. Yeah, yeah but now people tend to sort of, you know, if they're copying something, they, they, it tends to be everybody copies the same thing. You know, they all copy Blade Runner. It's like there are, <laughs> Blade Runner is a great movie, but there are other movies. Other movies are available. Yeah. <laughs> well, isn't the bigger thing now that uh, you're much more likely to get homages or references or nodding, um, yeah. indulgent tributes because everybody knows or everybody can Google or they'll tomorrow be a YouTube video saying, do you see where this comic swipe came from? and telling you the whole story. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that, wasn't, that wasn't a thing 50 years ago. It wasn't possible, was yeah. it? And then no. on the other hand of that, you also get people who go and treat things that are uh, clearly artistic devices as if it was a mistake. 
Yes. You know what I mean? That's the other side of it. That I remember saying that last week somebody on one of these, one of the one of the many different social medias that young people use these days, <laughs> uh, that I was like having a look at and somebody like calling out George Lucas for a mistake, which is fair enough. There are plenty of them in his work, but the the fact that he'd chosen to do um, a wipe which closes up on C-3PO's face uh, as a transition scene from one to another and going, well, that was a terrible mistake. How did that get through the editing <laughs> process? Like, no, it was an artistic choice. Like, what's yeah. wrong with you people? Yeah. Talking of artistic choices, mm-hmm. I think now let's have a look, Beth, at oh. yours. One second, as I share a new portion of the screen. Mine's going to be nowhere near the level of in-depth as uh, the discussion that we had about that. (laughs) Um, One second. Just a technical thing here. There we go. Yeah, just trying to change the... Is this, oh, that's not going to do it. Uh, Is this changing the proportion of the picture as you see it on your screen? Because that will change it the way it comes out on the recording. So are you seeing? We're seeing the full picture there. You're seeing the full picture now. Okay. Uh, For the... For the benefit of the listener at home, you shouldn't need to see this picture. If you want to, it's on my website, kevfcomicartist.com, and on my Twitter. And it should be on the podcast, uh, wherever you're getting your podcasts from. But as I say, you you shouldn't need to see it because we are about to describe it, aren't we, Peter? Yep. You want me to take this one? Please. Okay. Uh, It's a rooftop scene and... uh... There's a girl in a very short skirt uh, who has just left the top of the building on riding a motorbike, and she's going by Felicia, and chasing her on the rooftop is a running figure of a girl with white hair who, from the Felicia, uh, I'm going to assume is the black cat, and she's going, what, do I know you? To the other girl. Yeah, and um, for the benefit of the panelologists listening who are sticklers for these things, I would immediately be critical of the order in which the voice bubbles appear, because by Felicia is at the top of the panel, and do I know you, uh, in response to having had her name Felicia said, is at the bottom of the panel, but surely the Felicia should appear to the left of the do I know you panel. Maybe I'm wrong about that. I don't know. Maybe it doesn't matter. It looks great. No, I think you're right. I think they should have reversed the panel, basically. Uh, The bike's got to go from left to right, but then I'd want to see the person on the bike before I saw the person on the left. Do you know, this is suggesting to me it might have been done Marvel method, although I think we've guessed that it's a DC comic because of one of the characters is in it, haven't we? But Marvel method, um, everybody uh, is probably familiar with, is where the artist draws the picture and then the writer comes back in and adds the words over the top. And you can sometimes get this sort of thing happening. Uh, or would you get that more happening in the scripted script? Oh, I don't know. Let's cut that bit out. Um, <laughs> OK, they're running from right to left. The bike's going off the right hand side of the picture. Uh, black cat, are we saying? I was going to yeah, say black, I mean, black canary. No, no, no. I think it's black cat from Spider-Man, uh, who was called Felicia, if I remember oh. rightly. So it is Marvel method. So what does Black Canary look like? Doesn't she have... Black Canary's got blonde hair and uh, used to be like fishnet tights and big boots. Right, it's that all black costume. Yeah, and the brushwork as well. Artistic styles have changed so much over the years that um, because people flip from one company to another, there's, I mean, there's never entirely been a house style, but quite often uh, you would see a house style uh, or an artist style and think that they belonged uh, with one company or the other. And you'd say the same with colouring. And this has got the line work dropped back, uh, but yet quite a flatness to the colour, not an over coloredness And Overcoloring is what I think of as the Marvel way. Uh, nowadays, Marvel spends more time coloring a page than I think they ever used to do producing an entire 17 page comic. And coloring is so intense. I watch YouTube videos about coloring and I think, really? I, could, I, used, to, I used to like black and white. Um, OK, Peter, are you guessing? Are you going to give us a guess at exactly what this is from? Yeah, I'm guessing it's. I'm guessing it's from one of the Spider-Man titles. 
um, probably 1980s. And I am guessing from the colouring that it is from the 21st century, but I'll say it's uh, between 2000 and 2010. And um, I'll have to be proven wrong when we find out it's a Marvel title. But I'm just going to say everything about it to me says a DC title. And I'll say that it's from the Batman universe. Beth, how wrong am I? How wrong are we both? <laughs> You're both quite wrong, uh, but it's certainly closer than I think I would have got trying to come into this blind had I not re realised. Um, this is uh, Marvel. It is from 2018. And it is uh, the um, uh, unbelievable Gwenpool <gasps> is the character. Oh, OK. Right, who is one of my favourite of the Marvel characters. Um, uh, and this this panel has lived in my head for such a long time <laughs> since the first time I saw it. Uh, it's just, I, I must think about it like three or four times a day. Um, and I've no idea, like, there's just, it's, it's one of those things that perfectly captures what, what it is that I love about comics and my sense of humor, I think, in terms of what it, in, in terms of how I would go and, um, if I was writing for Marvel or if I was writing a, a film based on a comic book, this is the sort of thing that I would have in it. Uh, if you know what I mean. Um, the by Felicia thing is a reference to the ice cube movie Friday. Um, whoa, 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 the ice cube movie. Oh wait, ice cube, the person yeah, and yeah. movie called Friday the movie called Friday. In. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, an yeah. old person catches up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, which that yeah, there's a, a character called Felicia who's uh, constantly who he has absolutely no interest in despite her flirting with him. And there's a thing about, you know, uh, and, and that sort of became a meme across the Internet of the like by Felicia when you've had enough of somebody and you want them to go away. Um, and the idea that this happens within this, I mean, Gwenpool herself uh, has the has the pink speech bubble as well, which uh, often in comics goes and denotes that they're not from the same universe as everybody else, uh, in that she's from our world, the actual world where we wander about and buy Marvel comics. And through something that we don't quite know, she's ended up in uh, the uh, Earth 616 of the Marvel comics. So uh, Gwen Gwenpool breaks the fourth wall. Totally. But also people always think of it as being a bit more like uh, Deadpool. But because uh, and the number of people I've spoken to, oh, is that like Gwen Stacy, but as Deadpool? And it's it's not at all. Her name is actually Gwen Pool. It's uh, two separate names. But when she goes to get her costume, they go and uh, make it into a single one and go, all right, OK, well, I'll give you something kind of Deadpool themed. Um and yet she is a comic book nerd from our reality who's trapped inside these things. So she knows everybody's secrets. She knows who everybody is. She knows all of their backstories. She's read everything. So, uh, and she also knows that because she's the star of the comic book, she can't die. So she's prepared to take ridiculous risks. Um, and that's kind of, and all of that seems to come together in this single panel with Felicia, who's obviously spent since the, <laughs> since the 60s with Spider-Man, desperately trying to hide you know her actual identity from other people um and for this to have come into it and and it's just so something about it just always uh, stuck in my head since the first time i saw it do you know what this is making me realize well obviously my age because there are so many things from the world of memes to uh the techniques used in ma uh, in manga that need to be mm. described and explained to me. And I'm I'm feeling that because I didn't drink this in as a kid, I might never catch up to speed with it. The mm. pinkness of her voice bubble, and I'd seen the pinkness in her voice bubble. I don't think I was so sure as to what it actually connoted. By Felicia, the meme, listener, did you know that? Okay, I they sure all knew didn't. that. They all knew that. <laughs> That's just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the artist's uh, a Brazilian artist called uh, Danilo Baruth, who's done all sorts of stuff for, for Marvel in the last sort of 10 years has really tried to go and find people from outside the, the, the core of what the artists and writers were throughout the 60s and 70s, you know, um, and we can see that with like a lot of the, the reboots that they've done for uh, and for example with Miles Morales Spider-Man it's all yeah. sort of part of that um moon girl as well who that's had a reboot recently that's um that has you know that they've they've started bringing people in from all over the world from all sorts of different backgrounds and for me it's made comics so much more exciting in the last sort of 10 years to sort of 
find these new stories and to see where they can go and to, to uh, from people who've grown up in an entirely different world from the one that I was was growing up in, but a world that I found myself part of and a world that I absolutely adore. So I, I you know, I really, really love to see to see stuff like this. Um, and it seems that the comics, the Marvel comics, are racing ahead of the Marvel movies. The Marvel movies largely being made uh, about the characters and the comics from forty and fifty years ago, yeah. and the current comics doing something way, way different. Yeah, and I think uh, we're going to start to see that. Well, that's sort of over this next year. Now that they've started to do the Marvel TV series, we're going to see more of that changing, I think, because um, uh, in part because they've now started bringing in some more of the sort of like the characters that you didn't really see before that. But we've got Ms. Marvel coming up later on this year, um, exec produced by uh, um, Bishop, Bishop K. Ali, who was uh, a comedian on the UK stand-up circuit who... Yes. went off to Hollywood and is now and is now show running this um but yeah and because Ms Marvel which uh, is, is one of the stories that sort of came through from from th that particular thing that Marvel was trying to do um in terms of trying to get more people um to 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 do them to to create the, the comics um so yeah and yeah it's exciting it's very exciting. how do you how do you consume your Marvel comics are you getting them as as floppies as we call them or digital um, most well, until the pandemic, uh, mostly still, uh, you know, single issues, uh, occasional, you know, trades. And um, yeah, I, I mean, I've got like three long boxes under my bed right now of just all of my comics. That, uh, that, and one of the things that I do whenever I get a really well paid job is I go and buy one of the uh, rarer comics that I want that's too expensive to sort of buy the original. What uh, would be an example of a, a rare comic that you sought out that you so wanted? Well, <laughs> I think my favourite example of that, uh, from the mid-70s when Stan was on such a roll that nobody over at Marvel ever wanted to tell him that he'd come up with a terrible idea, um, in the era of when they were doing the giant-sized comics, like the things like the giant size X-Men that they um, that uh, included the, the Days of Future Past, past storyline and, and, and so on. But the one that I bought uh, most recently was the uh, issue number one of the hilariously poorly titled Giant-Sized Man-Thing. <laughs> is that with Howard the Duck? Uh, Howard the Duck isn't actually in, in that one, but yeah, yeah, Howard the Duck was related. And again, Howard the Duck is one of the main characters in Gwenpool as well, which is uh, one of the things that I absolutely adore with, uh, in a long, uh, one of the references that I love within this. This um, is one of the things that I that means I have to get more up to speed because Howard the Duck was my favourite as a kid, the, the original Steve Gerber and uh, Gene yes. Colan Howards. And then Howard uh, disappeared for a while or was badly used for a while as well. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, and I think a lot of those characters that are like that, that are more at the periphery of things, because I think for a long time, comics went through this thing of uh, they're for kids and then all of the kids who who were into them grew up and now they're for adults and now they have to take themselves too seriously and these things that don't really take them seriously are not for the real fans and so we don't want people to be part of it and I and I feel like it, it feels like comics are finally or at least the American comics of the, 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 the superhero comics are evolving beyond that again and so you're able to get that and one of the best comics I've, I've read recently was a recent run of uh, the spectacular spider uh, sorry the yeah, is it Spectacular Spider Ham? Um, Peter spider Porker. Spider Ham, Peter Porker. My Peter God. Porker, yeah, yeah. A spider who was bitten by a radioactive pig and uh, develops all of the powers of a, a, a pig with, with Spider Man's powers, who ends up in our reality. Um, and yeah, an absolutely wonderful sort of taking a similar sort of. Um, Taking it, the sort of the similar sort of uh, through line of things like how that Howard the Duck did, uh, of being transported into Earth six one six, and I think it's yeah, I really really love those stories because There's they can go and take the things that are super serious within these things and have really serious points that they're talking about about the way that we experience the world and what it's like to be an outsider and what it's like to grow up within that and how we really re relate to the world and finding our truth in this world, however it is that we do that, but also. Be being able to have things that are ridiculously silly on the top of them. Well, this meta um, approach to comics, uh, there's been lots of things in the past, like Ambush Bug uh, was uh, yeah. another example. Um, that happens a lot in TV now. We, we do break the fourth wall. We do things. Mm -hmm. uh, the Good Fight TV series, um, which my yes. wife watches, but I don't, does this same thing. People will break into song and they'll, they'll uh, break the fourth wall and they'll essentially start giving essays within the context of a drama. And yet you still believe the drama. Mm -hmm. But I think comics have led the way with that. 
Yeah, absolutely. Do you know absolutely. the third? Just... You know the... Oh, sorry, Peter. Well, I was just going to say, uh, Howard the Duck um, made me remember there was a thing, it was a sort of one-off Marvel anthology called, I think, Bizarre Adventures in about sometime in the early 80s, I'm guessing. Yeah. Um, and it was, you know, a collection of just the one-off strips. And there was a Howard the Duck story, and I can't remember who did the art or the writing, but the premise was basically the same as It's a Wonderful Life, you know, and Howard is shown, you know, what the world would be like without him. And everybody is happier. Everybody's better <laughs> off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a very much, there's a there's a panel in, uh, in the Spider-Ham where it's got all of the other uh, Marvel superheroes of that world all just laying into him about <laughs> well we don't like him because he's he's constantly going on about cryptocurrency and he's doing this and he's doing that and he's really annoying and he ate all of my food and you know the their world's version is the black bolt saying i was literally about to scream at you then even though i know that it would have killed everyone in this dimension um which is just wonderful stuff i love those yeah. sorts of things that is wonderful <laughs> what a marvelous recommendation and indeed pair of recommendations we've had today peter led us to look at the whole range of work by jim steranko and bethany has brought in for us a gwenpool oh who created gwenpool um oh actually do you know i don't even know that to be honest. <laughs> me neither uh, but the artist <laughs> what we were looking at was uh, Danin, danilo beruth am i right yeah yeah that's correct yeah that will do. Peter, Bethany, thank you so much for coming to join us today. That was Comic Cuts. If you've enjoyed us, if you've enjoyed it or have any questions, you can find us at our various social medias. Uh, Peter, where will we find you on the socials? Uh, Instagram, that's a, probably about it. I mean, I'm on Facebook, but it's friends only. So. And Beth, where do we find you? I'm on all of them. I've, uh, I've got my uh, Twitter, uh, Bethany Black, spelt with two Fs, because I worked with a guy who uh, had never seen my name written down, and he was from the east end of London, and so he wrote it phonetically as B-E-F-F-E-R-N-I-E, -E, Bethany. Uh, Bethany Black, is on, and, and that's the same for my uh, Twitch handle. I do a daily show on there where I, I just talk rubbish for a couple of hours whilst people join in. <laughs> <laughs> Go to the socials and search for Bethany Black. Uh, Google Peter Hogan. And if you haven't seen Resident Alien, what the hell have you been doing with the last year of your TV consumption? You'll find me uh, on Twitter at KevF Comic Artist and on the website kevfcomicartist.com. Please click subscribe to be sure of hearing every episode of this when it comes out. Thanks again to Peter Hogan and to Bethany Black and to you at home for listening. I've been KevF and this has been Comic Cuts, the panel show. And we're out. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, it's so good. Oh, um, good. Uh I don't mind showing off my ignorance, but boy, I felt ignorant today. <laughs> well, I was say I kind of like, uh, I had a similar sort of thing.